still have uh, many more ways to go towards full equality, but it's really wonderful and exciting that we can celebrate this moment in New York's history together. Many of you have been uh, contacting CBST, contacting the office, saying, terrific, we want to get married, but we have all these questions. And so I'm really, uh, really pleased that we were able to put together such a phenomenal program this evening to talk about uh, many of those benefits, but also consequences of getting legally married. I especially want to thank our executive director, I think Samet, for putting this panel together and uh, <laughs> Member Art Leonard for moderating our panel and all of our panelists. So you, you should have received several pieces of information when you came in this evening. Uh, on this one side of this uh, lavender sheet uh, has the bios of all of the panelists. So you can see who's who and uh, where they are in the world. We have been receiving lots and lots of questions and queries about how is it that I get legally married or how do I get married at all at CBST. And we wanted to share a little bit of that information with you. On the other side of this lavender uh, piece of paper, which you'll notice uh, is legal size. <laughs> legal size, thank you. Um, has on the top of it the new CBST Kiddushin, or Jewish wedding, civil merit and civil marriage procedures. These are all of the different ways in which we would love to celebrate with you if you're thinking about getting civilly married or if you've never had a Jewish wedding in the first place. So please take some time and look through this as well. If you are thinking, uh, and this will really help us out uh, as a clergy team at CBST, if you're thinking about getting legally married or if you've never had a Jewish wedding and you want to do the whole thing, we're very excited to celebrate that with you. And we have this packet that is available over there on the uh, on the shelf that's right above the cedarine. It is our application for Kiddushin, Jewish weddings, and civil marriage at CBST. Because we know that there are some people who have had Jewish weddings that are now waiting for the opportunity to make it legal in New York State. We also know that there are many of you who have not yet uh, had a, a Jewish wedding and now would like to make the whole thing legal all at once, and everything in between. We have some guidelines and some procedures that we'd like you to take note of. So please, if you are interested or thinking about this, uh, let your plans be known. You're not tied into a date, you're not tied into a particular moment, but it's really helpful for us as we plan for the, the next year, really, in the next couple of years, what this will look like and how it will impact our congregation. If you have had a Jewish wedding ceremony and you, quote, win the lottery to get a civil marriage license from the city of New York on Sunday in Manhattan, CBST will be in the park across from the Marriage Bureau with our really beautiful, wonderful rainbow koba. And if you would like for Rabbi Kleinbaum or myself to sign your civil marriage license, if you've already had a Jewish ceremony, we'd be happy to do that. And on that uh, lavender legal-sized piece of paper is a phone number where you can call and let us know if you're planning to be there, and we can welcome and celebrate with you. Please, if you're thinking about having a ceremony at any point, Fill out this application and let us know what your plans are because that will help us plan to best meet the needs of our congregation during this really exciting time. So it's been a long time and we're really excited to say Mazel Tov to everyone. We're also here for you as you learn this evening about some of the legal ramifications, the legal implications of getting married, to also think about some of the pastoral or emotional questions that you may have or that may come up as you're thinking about what it means to change this status in your partnership. And I want to encourage you to please feel free to use the CBSD office as a resource and support for you as well. So I'm pleased to turn this over to Art Leonard, who will moderate our panel this evening. If you have questions, um, please do fill out this piece of paper, uh, this, uh, this application for Kiddushin or civil marriage licenses here. You can leave it here with us. And I'll be here all evening if you have questions after the panel. Thanks so much. Thank you, Rabbi. Uh, let me give you an idea of how we've structured the evening. We're planning to go up to two hours, depending on how many questions people have. But we're going to start out, I'm going to give a brief introduction, take you through the relevant statutes about marriage, the Federal Defense of Marriage Act and the New York Marriage Equality Act, uh, and then we'll have our panel. Each of the panelists will speak for up to 15 minutes on the particular area that we've allocated to them based on their expertise and practice experience. And then we'll open it up to questions and answers. And uh, ask you that in terms of your questions, 
try not to ask us questions that are narrowly particular about an extraordinary, unusual set of facts involving a particular individual. That's the kind of thing to do one on one with the attorney. The, the question and answer is more for general interest, questions that, that you think will, uh, will be interesting to a significant number of people because we have a limited amount of time. Uh, in terms of the statutes that we're dealing with, the legal status of matters that we're dealing with, we really have to start with a little bit of history. Not too much, but a little bit of history. Uh, the ability of same-sex couples to marry has been on the agenda of at least some people in our movement since the 1960s. Some of the earliest manifestos for gay rights that we find in the archives list same-sex marriage as one of the goals of the movement. But it really first emerged as an issue in the early 1970s, after Stonewall, when the more militant gay rights organizations got started. And around the country, a handful of people filed lawsuits seeking to compel the issuance of marriage licenses to same-sex couples. All of them were unsuccessful. The courts usually relied on the dictionary. They said, the dictionary says a marriage is a union between a man and a woman. What you're suing for is the marriage. We can't give it to you. And they rejected all constitutional claims. And so the issue sort of died away after those early failures. But it became a big issue again in the late 1980s because of two important cultural uh, occurrences. One was the startling increase in the number of lesbians who were having children through donor insemination. There was the beginning of a baby boom in the gay community in the 1980s, and not being married was a big problem in people's everyday lives. In addition, there was the AIDS epidemic, which brought a startling realization to many, many gay people, especially gay men who were affected directly by AIDS in larger numbers, that not being married to your partner was a considerable problem in dealing with hospitals, in dealing with the public welfare system, in dealing with funeral homes, in dealing with nursing homes, in any kind of institution in our society, and certainly the government. So all of a sudden, once again, marriage was on the agenda, and lawsuits started to get filed. And one lawsuit in particular led to the passage of the Federal Defense of Marriage Act. That was a lawsuit filed in Hawaii. And in 1993, the Supreme Court of Hawaii, for the first time in the history of the world, the highest court of any jurisdiction, ruled that same-sex couples might be entitled to marriage. And a trial was scheduled to be held. The trial eventually was to be held in October of 1996, in the middle of a presidential and congressional election year. And what happened was the Republican Party seized upon this as an issue for the election. That they figured they would propose a statute to somehow outlaw same-sex marriage and get the Democrats to be on the other side, and it would become a wedge issue in the campaign. So the Republicans introduced in Congress the Defense of Marriage Act. And it was promptly endorsed by President Clinton, who was running for re-election, and all the Democratic leaders, pretty much all the Democratic leaders, in order to take this issue out of the election. So the Defense of Marriage Act, which was passed in the fall of 1996, was enacted basically for no reason at all other than politics. Because at the time it was passed, there was no place in the world where same-sex couples could get married. It was an answer looking for a question. It was like, what if same-sex couples can marry? What if the Hawaii Supreme Court ultimately holds that same-sex couples can marry and people can go to Hawaii and get married and go back home and claim that their marriage was entitled to recognition? So it was this great fear. So the Defense of Marriage Act was passed. Uh, on a handout that we put on, this, on the seats, you can see the two key provisions of the Defense of Marriage Act. Section 2 says that no state is required by the Constitution to honor same-sex marriages contracted in other states. That's section two. Section three said that the federal government will not recognize same-sex marriages as marriages, even if they're lawful in the state where they're contracted. And in order to be a spouse under federal law, you have to be married to someone of the opposite sex. Basically what it said. Uh, for those who are curious, Section 1 said, this, this statute shall be called the Defense of Marriage Act. So we don't normally quote that. But I just threw it in for those who are interested. So that is the backdrop because that is still in effect. Which means that marriage equality is only partial marriage equality for now. 
we have a New York State statute, the Marriage Equality Act, that says for purposes of New York State law, and I've given you the language on, on the front of this handout, for purposes of New York State law, different sex and same sex marriages are equal, are to be treated equally in every respect under New York State law. No one is to be denied a marriage license. No couple is to be denied a marriage license because of the gender of the parties. Which means we not only have marriage for gay people, we have marriage for trans people. We have marriage for everybody because it doesn't matter what the gender of the parties are. Now, the main sticking point in passing this in the last hour, as you probably were following in the media, was the religious exception provisions. And there are several religious exception provisions. The ones that are most important for us, first of all, is that basically no religious entity and no organization controlled by a religious entity may be required to perform any marriage that they don't want to perform or to lend their facilities for the performance of the marriage if they don't approve of it. And this is really just codifying what is already required by the Constitution, which guarantees the free exercise of religion. So religious organizations are not required to do it, but they're allowed to, and many will in New York State. But the other part of the religious exception, which is the part that I'm worried about, is the one that says basically any organization that's affiliated with and controlled by religion can basically treat same-sex marriages as if they didn't exist. And if you think about it, that's an awful lot of institutions in our society. That is religious colleges and universities. That is religious hospitals. That is religious schools. Religious social welfare agencies. Technically, it's possible that they will be held to be exempt from having to recognize same-sex marriages. The language is a bit difficult to interpret. No one is quite sure how the courts will ultimately interpret it. It's some of the language is borrowed from the religious exception in our state civil rights law. And I looked it up, there are only been a handful of cases. Uh, one thing we know for sure, St. John's University is a religious entity. Because when they were sued by a Jewish man who was denied a job as an administrator for religious discrimination, the court said, well, they're exempt from complying with the human rights law on religion because they're a religious entity. So you know, we don't know how that will work out. And then there is a provision in the law that says that anyone challenges in court any of the provisions of this law and it's held to be invalid, the whole law is invalid. So we ask anyone who runs into a problem, like with a religious organization or something, don't go running into court because if God forbid you win, none of us can get married. You know, that's, that's what I call the poison pill provision. It's to stop people from challenging it. Because there are some fears that the religious exemption may be a little broader than it has to be, and it may violate the establishment of religion provisions in the Constitution. So they're, they're trying to insulate it from challenge. So those are the laws we have. We now have a state law that says any couple can get married, provided they meet all the other requirements in terms of age uh, and not being married to somebody else at the same time, things of that sort. They can get married regardless of their sex and that that marriage has to be treated the same as any other marriage by the state government. Does it have to be treated the same by non-governmental entities? And setting aside religious entities for now, regular businesses and other <coughs> institutions, non-religious colleges and universities, the other entities in our society. For that, we have to look to our human rights law, which says, that places of public accommodation may not discriminate based on sex or sexual orientation or marital states. And that should be helpful to us if you run into a private employer who says, well, I don't recognize this marriage. You say to them, well, under the state human rights law, you have to recognize this marriage. And I think uh, if push comes to shove and we end up in court, we'll find that businesses will have to recognize these marriages. Landlords will have to recognize these marriages. Schools will have to recognize these marriages. In terms of employee benefits, it's a different story because of a federal statute called the Employee Retirement Income Security Act, which preempts state law on the regulation of employee benefit plans. Because of that statute, the state cannot dictate to private employers the content of employee benefit plans. So there we may have a situation where some employers may refuse to recognize these marriages and it may be that we can't cure that problem in court. 
But for government employees, you do. The government does have to recognize those marriages, and we already even have a decision on that from a court of state in a case involving Monroe County Community College, where a lesbian couple who married in Canada came back, and uh, one of them was an employee and wanted to put her wife on the employee benefit plan. They said no. She sued. The court said, we recognize Canadian marriages, and under the human rights law, you have to treat her as a spouse and put her on the benefit plan. Mm -hmm. So as to that, we, we were pretty well settled on public employers. So if you work for the public schools, the public hospital, public university, government agency, they will have to recognize that marriage. Uh, and at this point, I think I should turn it over to our panel because we have so much to cover. And when we were first discussing setting this up, we were saying 10 minutes apiece. And then we made a list of all the things everyone's going to cover. And people were sending me emails saying, 10 minutes, I can't. So we're going to do 15. But if anyone finishes early, that's fine. And then we'll open it up to questions. So we're going to start with Judith Turkell. Assets or naming beneficiaries, titling your assets on any 
then your assets will go to your designated next of kin, as that is defined by New York law. And we'll hear later about how marriage has changed that. So. And it has in a huge way. But this does nothing to provide for what happens if you're married and you don't have a will. You've not provided, you might provide for your spouse, but you've not provided for what happens if you both die or you die together. You've not provided for your kids if you have children. Marriage does not do everything. It's not a, it's not a one stop everything. So for those who are married and those who are not married, it's really important to prepare a will who says where you want your assets to go. In addition to wills, all kinds of trusts, which are sometimes especially important for people who have unknown or remote relatives that need to do certain kinds of planning to avoid probate. Other kinds of trusts are equally important where there are uh, possible challenges where family members are hostile and could be a problem. Next, we're going to go into advanced directives. Can you all hear me? We're doing okay? Yes. Okay. <laughs> okay. Advanced directives. These are documents that set out what happens in the end of the capacity. There's a whole series of different documents. They're really important for everyone, married or not married. First is the healthcare proxy. That's where you can appoint an agent to make any and all medical decisions for yourself at any time you cannot make them for yourself. There's a recent change in the law in New York, which in New York public health law, which now recognizes domestic partners in addition to spouses as people who have the right to make medical decisions when the person is incapacitated. That's a huge and recent change. But you can't count on the hospital you're in knowing that, getting that, proving your domestic partnership. You still want to have these documents in place. A durable power of attorney is an appointment of an agent, or what's called an attorney in fact, which is a person who can handle financial, insurance, property, and all matters other than health care decisions. A guardian designation would allow you to appoint a person who would become your legal guardian in that you're incapacitated. It requires a court appointment, but if you don't set out who you want it to be, likely that the court's going to look to your so-called next of kin, which could be an estranged sibling, an estranged parent, it might not be your partner. So again, Married, you might be more presumption in terms of a spouse, but if you're not, it's very important to set out who it should be. Visitation document. This is one of those things that we developed in those early years of running in and out of hospitals in the 80s with lots of sick clients. And it's an opportunity to say in a very simple, basically notarized paragraph that if you're in intensive care or some kind of restricted hospitalization, that you want to designate who has priority to visit you. Really important. You might not want, even if you like your family, they might not be people you want. It might be a partner, it might be your circle of friends. And so that's something that we developed many years ago and still commonly used by lawyers in our community. And a relatively new one is something that allows you to decide what happens to your body when you die. It used to be that you'd have a will and it might say you might be cremated. When you die, the funeral home would say, we're not cremating that person unless the family consents and we have this comfort. So now we have a document that's got a long, horrible name, which is called the body document but essentially it allows you to say that you want to be buried or you want to be cremated and it appoints a person to make those arrangements. Very important. You can't assume that it's going to be okay and that your family and partner and friends will work out. A living will expresses the types of life-sustaining treatment that a patient does or does not want to perform, the kind of end of, end of life to decisions, or a person's loss of capacity to make those decisions or communicate them. It allows you in advance to say what you do and don't want it in a serious term. And lastly, the HIPAA authorization, you know, when you go to the doctor, they give you all these papers about medical privacy, and then they continue to say patient's names out loud anyway. Um, <laughs> 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 exactly. Right. Just talking about or diagnosis. Anyway, it's, uh, a HIPAA authorization is a simple <laughs> statutory authorization that allows you to say who should have access to your medical records. So if you're sick, or in the hospital, you're in, a, you're in a treatment situation, the person who you appointed as your as your authorized person can have full access to medical records. So those are these so-called advanced records. Um, now I'm going to go quickly into property issues. So there are different forms of ownership of property. This can be with a partner or just with any other person. Um, the first is, and the most protective in many ways, is something called joint tenants with rights of survivorship. This could be for a co-op, a house, a condominium, whatever the capacity it is. It allows two people to own property in such a way that there's an automatic passing to the surviving owner upon death. So even if the person doesn't have a will, they have their primary assets often to come up in their condo or their home, by having ownership in that way, at least they're certain that that asset will pass to the co-owner. There are some downsides to it. It, it, it has a presumption of 50-50 ownership that may not always be true. In a breakup, it can become very messy. Uh, 
um, in that situation, the government can assume that the person died on all of it, and then it's about proving otherwise, we'll hear more about that perhaps later. But the you know, short answer is keep records of who contributed what, which nobody does, but of course that's what we can find. Uh, next form is tenants in common. This is a form of ownership where two or more people can own unequal interest in a particular property. So a couple who might put in different amounts, they might not want a survivorship right. But be careful of this, and it's kind of the default. I can't tell you how many hundreds of clients have come in who say, oh, we own it together, and I say, yeah, I see the deed, and you see the stock certificate. And they think for sure that they have a survivorship. And something happened with closing, papers were flying, Things happened at the last minute, the bank attorney was late, and the stamp never got put on the stock certificate, and they don't own it that way. You can fix it, it's a pain in the neck, but it can be fixed, but you have to know what needs to be fixed. Mm -hmm. So the default of tenants in common means if one person dies, didn't have a will, and the person's coupled, not married, but coupled, then the, the surviving owner could end up owning that property with a mother. You know, so your, your boyfriend could end up owning with your mother or your sister or whoever your next of kin. That's not always what you want. So really important. It might be okay, but you need to have the conversation, talk to your lawyer, and be aware of it. And those of you who already bought property, not sure, go back and look. It's either going to be on the face of the stock certificate, or if you have a condo or a house, it's going to be on the deed. If it says nothing, then it's tenants in common. Tenants by the entirety, I'll we'll think you more about later as well, but that's only for people who are going to be married. It also has a, a, a survivorship, automatic survivorship, and there's some limited uh, creditor protections. It's new for our community. We've been trying for many years to educate title companies and managing agents and co-ops that people who've been married even before New York had this in Massachusetts and elsewhere could own property that way. We made some progress. Okay, next I'm going to go quickly into agreements. Um, why you need them if you're not married. We'll hear more, of course, about marriage and how marriage steps out, what happens. We'll talk about that a little bit, I think. What happens if you're married and things don't work out. But if you're not married, you really have to, it's up to you to put it in writing about what you want to have happen. There's no body of law that's going to be out for you. So there's a series of things um, to consider. A joint property ownership agreement would be for each of people who own property together to spell out who contributed what, how they want to own it, uh, before they close, of course they have deal time to do it, although it almost never happens then. If it happens at all, it happens later, but it's an opportunity to say, you want to own a joint prescribed survivorship, if you don't, it's an opportunity to say who's going to contribute how much cash, the down payment, the closing costs, <coughs> and then how are you going to pay things going forward. Most couples don't have equal contributions, financial to their relationship. Most couples, one parent one than the other, substantially or somewhat. So it's an opportunity to spell out how you want things to be on an ongoing basis, not necessarily a breakup, but just moving forward, how you're going to pay the mortgage, how you're going to pay the maintenance, whatever your obligations are. And then if you do make conflict, then it gives you a way of resolving it. You might even have built in methods of dispute resolution, such as counseling, collaborative law, arbitration mediation, um, to work out conflicts. Domestic partnership or cohabitation agreements are uh, options for those who don't necessarily own property with their partners but still want to spell out how they're going to live financially as a couple. It allows you to spell out what your contributions are going to be on an ongoing basis, how you live. It allows you to say whether you're intending to pool your assets or not. It allows you to address what happens if you break off when one of you might or might not have a claim against the other one's assets. Often with couples with huge disparities in their income, it's very comforting to just dive in into these agreements as hard as it is because then they know. They do it painful, and they finish, they put it away, and hope they never look at it again, but they know that if they do separate, they've already done the work to figure out how they're going to separate. That's up to five minutes, the one minute, I want to talk. Okay, I got to Okay, quickly going through children, issues uh, with children. So traditionally, adoption is a process in which birth parents' rights are terminated, an individual or a married couple can then adopt a child. It's 1995 in New York State, unmarried couples can both be parents even where one, only one, is a legal or adoptive parent. It's called second parent adoption. It's uh, been doing this a number of years, well, quite a few years at this point. They're going very well. It's amazing to me until marriage happened in New York. It's a single most significant family law protection we had in New York State. And we have it. It's, uh, it's, it's doable. But it is a process. The legal effect of the adoption is to create absolute legal rights between the adoptive parent and the child. It makes the partners equal so that one may have been the biological child, a sperm donor, a surrogacy, adoption, the other partner gets to create the same rights. So that if they separate, there's 
There's not going to be a presumption anymore that one was really the parent, the one who carried the child for nine months, or one with the first adoption. It makes them both equal parents. It's really, really important. Without that in New York, and without marriage, which we'll put aside for a moment, there are no protections. The key thing, though, is adoption is forever. If it doesn't work out in a couple, the couple are still going to be parents to that child, and New York does not undo adoptions. New York appeals to the state. It's the appeal. The state's position is that um, adoptions are meant to create parental rights, and they never be severed. So it's not like you can break up and say, never mind, they didn't mean it, you're still a parent. Um, marriage has changed in some ways. There's all this presumption. Um, the new law that Art talked about is gender neutral. And so there's these presumptions in law that say that a child born to a married woman is supposed to be, this is the existing law, a child born to a married woman is presumed to be the child of a woman and her husband. If we take out and make this gender neutral, Michelle and I talked this yesterday, we don't know, but we think that under the new law, it may well be that a child born to a married person presumed to be the child of that person and his or her spouse. Doesn't mean you don't have to do an adoption. We have DOMA, and so if you go out of New York, you're, if, you, if you're basing your creation of parental rights on a marriage, you are not protected. As long as DOMA exists, you can't step out of New York and expect to have solid parental rights. Why do this? Um, Okay, breakups, just very quickly. Uh, breakups, um, again, with a uh, with marriage, there's a roadmap, there's body of law, there's all kinds of stuff that, that help guide lawyers and breaking up couples on how to separate their assets and their obligations and their, uh, their interests. But when they're not married, it's really who knows. It's the skill of the lawyers, it's the love of what lawyers involve, it's a whole bunch of creative claims that lawyers have developed over the years for um, unjust enrichment, partition, constructive trust, promissory estoppel, contract theories, all this stuff. Very complicated, not where you want to be. You can avoid these things sometimes with an agreement. Sometimes we can have an agreement and still end up in court. And we do have alternative methods of dispute resolution within the community for collaborative law, arbitration, mediation. But often it's end up in court, it's not where you want to be. Okay, and on a positive note, um, Marriage is a wonderful thing for many people. <laughs> we should celebrate this achievement, we should celebrate this milestone, but let's be thoughtful about our decision about whether or not to marry and the important way, and be mindful that there are other important ways of protecting your partner, yourself, and your relationships. And remember that some couples will choose not to marry and many may be really unable to marry. And so they are in our community, we are all a community, and so I hope we just stay mindful that embrace everyone's choice of how they live their lives, married or not, by choice or by necessity. So with that, good luck if you're in the lottery. <laughs>
and if it's you and children, then the law presumes that the estate will go to you and the children and uh, That's an important one because we know that a lot of uh, straight and gay couples don't do wills and Judith gave some of the examples about what happens uh, to unmarried couples who think they're going to be okay and then on death the family comes in and gets trouble. Um, you can uh, sue for wrongful death of your spouse, and we you know that there have been cases where partners um, whose spouse tragically died or was not able to do that. Now, um, you know, that's a right that spouses have. You, as Art mentioned, can be, uh, must be recognized as a spouse um, by employers for certain benefits, although not the federal pension benefits, and we'll talk about that a little bit. And one of the biggest uh, rights that you get, especially if you're a less money spouse, is in the absence of a prenuptial agreement, you have a right to share in the marital property, the property that was approved during marriage, whether it's titled in your name, your spouse's name, or both names. Um, and with marriage, there also comes duties. You do have a duty to support your spouse, but it's not as broad a duty as you would think, uh, as would be common English language usage. There's a duty to provide necessary, something called necessaries to your spouse. And that, basically, the upshot is you can't let your spouse become a public ward. Um, short of that, though, you're not responsible for their debts, generally speaking, unless you are a guarantor or uh, took the debt in joint names, and you're not, you don't have a duty to support them forever in some grand lifestyle or any lifestyle other than you sort of a minimum. You also, uh, well, if you're a money spouse, um, will, uh, if you divorce, end up giving a lot of, quote unquote, what you might consider your property to your spouse. Because when couples divorce, when couples who are legally married divorce, there is this roadmap called equitable distribution. And what it, the overview is that the law looks at the marriage as a full economic partnership, regardless of what people are earning, uh, if one person stayed home and ran the house, or entertained the other spouse's business people, or picked up the drug plan, or took care of the kids, that person is going to be the a partner for economic purposes with the person who brought in money. Um, so when you divorce, the court will, and it's called equitably, divide all the marital property. Marital property is everything that came into the marriage excuse me, everything that's acquired from the time the marriage begins. Uh, it can include a medical degree, it can include, it can include a law license, it can include a business, it clearly includes money that you, you earn and save, it includes property that you buy, and again, um, and it also includes, in the heterosexual context, pensions um, that are accrued during the marriage. So, if you're up to this point, you have your own stuff, and then you get married here, anything that goes from here to here is marital, and then you get divorced here. So you get to keep the stuff you brought in with if you don't put it in each other's names. But then everything that each spouse acquires during the marriage goes into that marital pot, and it's equitably divided. And equitable doesn't always mean 50-50, uh, but traditionally, the longer term the marriage, uh, it's, it tends more toward 50-50. Although we are seeing courts, interestingly, now take a, take a harder look at, for example, a business that one spouse really worked in and started and grew because of his or her efforts. And of course, in the early years, that equitable distribution were awarded 50% of that to the other spouse, and now they're awarding less. Um, so, so that's what, that, that, those are just some of the general duties and rights you get when you're married. And people, Judith talked a lot about gay couples who couldn't get married or don't want to get married. You can enter a cohabitation agreement or a domestic partnership agreement to say what you want to happen to your property. And you can do that. They're enforceable. In my experience, and this isn't always the case, usually gay couples who couldn't get married who were doing agreements were sort of kind of trying in whole or part to opt into that equitable distribution law. In other words, to to say we'll share our stuff, um, maybe not 50-50, but in a certain way. If you're legally married, you can opt out of that automatic presumption of, of sharing marital property by doing a prenuptial agreement. And so it's it's sort of a, I, I always forget it's the converse or the inverse, but 
the the you can get married and still keep your own separate property as long as you have a partner to the spouse execute a prenuptial agreement. Um, there are certain uh, technicalities that have to be followed. It has to be signed and acknowledged a certain way, but you know any, any competent lawyer can certainly help you do that. Uh, you can also do a postnuptial agreement, which pretty much provides for the same terms. It's a little uh, it's a little dicier, um, but but not it's it's certainly possible. Um, so now I'm also supposed to talk about uh, so so if you get married in New York, you you automatically have all these rights and obligations. It may take some time, frankly, for people in the public to understand them. You might have to have a dispute with, uh, with an employer. You might even have to have a dispute with, um, with hospitals. But hopefully, people, the reason we fought so hard for marriage is people know what it means. I'm married to her. I'm married to her. They know what that means. Um, so that, that should all work out, and those rights and obligations should be uh, pretty clear. But here, here's some of the problems that, that we see. We, we call it the portability issue. Art mentioned the Federal Defense of Marriage Act. So there is absolutely uh, an absolute bar, although it's not so absolute anymore, uh, against the federal government giving you any rights that if you were married to a person of the opposite sex, you would have. So no pension rights, no social security upon your spouse's death, and things like that. Uh, but we, and, and I guess uh, there's also, you don't get certain rights with respect to immigration, which more I need to talk about. And there's no way right now, barring the overturning of DOMA, that you can get those rights. However, there have been some interesting inroads made. And some of the things that we're seeing is that even in spite of the federal government saying, no, we can't give any rights to same-sex married couples, uh, spouses that we give to opposite uh, sex spouses. What we're seeing is um, the, uh, the Department of Justice, for example, has said that it will no longer challenge joint bankruptcy filings when a husband and wife or a wife and wife or a husband and husband file together. There have been a challenge to that and a, a, a court in San Francisco overturned it and the Department of Justice said we're not going to challenge that. Uh, in, in Medicaid, and I think somebody's going to talk a little bit more about that, uh, you know, to qualify for Medicaid, you have to have assets below a certain level. There, you're allowed to, in order to get below a certain level, you can transfer assets to your spouse. Uh, and they won't, they won't be assets that Medicaid will then go back. We have a, uh, I guess it was a ruling or an opinion letter by the uh, Department of Health and Human Services that says, DOMA doesn't apply here. I don't know how they got to that, but I'm very glad they did. And so we'll, we'll look at transfers uh, between same-sex spouses at the same non-exempt way that we look at, at uh, transfers to, to opposite-sex spouses. Um, I guess I'm looking at what else I'm supposed to talk about. Uh, the, I know I'm, I'm running out of time. The interesting thing is most of the, um, our fellow practitioners are still recommending that you're still wise to do documents similar to or exactly the same as those that you have talked about. And I should mention that in addition to the federal DOMA, a lot of states have what's called mini DOMAs, um, which, which basically say uh, we won't recognize any state's marriage uh, between same-sex couples. And there's a whole range of, of how strong or obnoxious those mini DOMAs are. Some say we won't give them any rights, we won't recognize anything. Some say, well, we'll recognize some things. Uh, so, for example, if you are married here and live here, and everything's great, and have children here, and then you go move to, I think Alabama is a good example, and you, you, uh, you end up, you know, you settle there, you raise your family there, and then 20 years later, you're going to get divorced. Well, maybe 20 years from now, but as things stand now, you can't get a divorce and you won't be recognized as legal spouses for any purpose. So even though it's a great advance, and I'm personally going to get married, and I encourage anybody who wants to get married and to think about it to do so, um, and to know what your rights and obligations are, there's still, it's sort of a, 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 a transient phase, a transition phase. So we're still recommending certainly the adoptions, as Judith said. I, I would recommend any client you know, let's 
roll the dice and hope that, you know, if it ever comes to litigation, this kid is going to be ruled to be your kid. Um, but even with the property and the health care proxies, um, everything that you can do, especially if you're traveling out of state, out of country, you should carry with you. And again, you probably shouldn't need it in New York State much or much longer, but you probably, in this period of time, until there's marriage equality everywhere, or at least the states are willing to recognize uh, same-sex marriages, are wise to do the, that whole uh, litany of documents that you <coughs> talked about, wills, health care proxies, property agreements, which if you're married, would be called a prenuptial. Um, I think, do I have more Okay. Um, I, I just, I'll give, I'll give I'll, I'll my time to the woman from, uh, anyway, I, I, I just want to say I'm really glad to be here. It's, it's, uh, it's my first opportunity to speak on the issue since the world chaos, and it's very exciting, but if you're going to get married, just go into it with open eyes and not only plan for issues that may arise between you and your spouse, such as, you know, what you're going to divorce, but plan to protect your family unit if you're going to be traveling around. So I thank you and I give the best of my time. And, and just to, to point out for people who might think about getting married and moving, there are places you can move where your marriage will be recognized. You can move to Iowa, where they have same-sex marriage. And most of New England, not all of New England yet, but uh, Massachusetts, Connecticut, Vermont, and New Hampshire have same-sex marriage, and your marriage will be fully recognized there. Rhode Island just adopted a civil union law, so if you move to Rhode Island, it will be recognized as a civil union. And New Jersey has a civil union law, and they will recognize the same-sex marriage from other states as a civil union. So you still have all the same rights under state law as if you were married, it won't be called marriage, but technically you would have all the same rights. And uh, the entire West Coast actually at this point, uh, California and Oregon and Washington all have domestic partnership, which is the equivalent of civil unions, which are all the rights of marriage and they will recognize. And in fact, if you happen to get married somewhere like Canada or Connecticut, during the period when they had same-sex marriage in California, from June 18, 2008 to November 5, 2008, it will be recognized as a marriage in California. We're living in a strange time. I guess the best place to go if you want your marriage to be recognized is Toronto. I mean, that's pretty safe. Okay, so next, uh, Shelly Gosh, who's a, uh, an accountant and tax expert, is going to talk to us about the tax issues that you should be aware of in terms of getting married. Well, she wanted to walk in. Hello, everybody. Can everybody hear me? You talk directly into the mic. Very close to the mic. Too close to the mic? No, no, no. Very close. How's everybody? Everybody all right? Thank you for coming. Um, I'm here today to talk to you about the income tax changes to same-sex couples now that we have the New York uh, marriage law. And uh, I was going to start with the federal taxation. I'm trying to not bore everybody and uh, make everybody glassy-eyed. So, but it's necessary to start with the federal because some of the concepts that I'm going to talk about flow to the state. Um, the first I want to talk about is filing status. Um, married people get to file, married joints, married or married separate. I'm sorry, am I wrong? No, 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 no. It doesn't matter what you say. Uh, I'm in front of the that's okay. that's okay. So, okay. so yeah. married, married people get to file, married joint or married separate. Married joint is beneficial in most circumstances. There are occasions when married separate is better, but that's very rare. And in fact, today, software will tell us, tax practitioners, whether a couple is benefits for married joint or married sex. So there is a lot of um, attention paid to married couples and tax planning for those people. The other two uh, filing statuses I'm going to talk about is single, which is a person who doesn't have any dependents, and head of household, which is a person that has a dependent. Moving on. I wanted to just clarify what deductions are against income 
deductions against income, which ultimately can lower your tax liability. These two types of deductions come in two flavors. There is itemized deductions, which are expenditures that the government deems you can deduct. These are real estate taxes, mortgage interest, and charity, etc. Then there's a standard deduction. If you have very few itemized deductions, the government, or none, the government will give you a number, and in 2010, for single and head of household, it was $5,700, and for married filing joint, it was $11,400. So you can also use the standard deduction to offset your income and reduce your tax liability. I wanted briefly to talk about the marriage penalty. I heard it flying around, I was talking about it. Uh, people might be a little fearful about it. Um, Basically, the marriage penalty is when two single people have more of a tax benefit than married joint. That's the marriage penalty is. It's not really a penalty, as you can see, it's just an, an additional tax that would be dormant within that married filing joint return that is greater, that is greater than the two singles. Today, there is no marriage penalty for the most part except for very high earners on the federal level. Now, of course, because of DOMA, we don't have to really think about that too much, but I wanted people to know on the state level, there really is no marriage penalty. So if anyone's thinking about that or wondering about that on the New York State level, I just want to Can I just make a clarification? You're comparing single to married? What about heads of households and married? What about it? Yeah, head of household has its own tax rate, head of household has its own... In terms uh, of the penalty. The marriage penalty? Yeah. Marriage penalty is not with head of household. It's just not defined that way. It's defined as two singles. Or I can look up to it and get back to you. Okay. okay. Any other we same-sex couples don't have equitable treatment under the tax code, the federal tax code, as uh, is evident by certain things that were said here today that basically do the DOMA. We can't file marry, whether it's in our benefit or not, and many, many times it's in benefit because somebody has a loss and it offsets a gain. There's just many reasons why units, household units, as spouses and couples are, with families, without families, when we don't file joint, there's a problem. And a lot of times that problem arises in the alternative minimum tax. You might ask, what is this? What is the alternative minimum tax? And the alternative minimum tax is really just an alternative tax calculation. All it is is different items on your tax returns that are recalculated. The alternative minimum tax is then compared to the regular tax, and you pay the higher of Once an alternative minimum tax general, just for your FYI, it's about $80,000 and you itemize, and that might kick you into your alternative minimum tax, those of you who are thinking about it. Um, and of course, we have inequitable treatment regarding health insurance. You know, it's taxed for us. It ends up many, many times on the W-2 of the employee spouse. I'm only trying to turn employee spouse, not employee, so we can be clear here. Terms are very... Uh, uh, gray for us. Um, so health insurance. Health insurance is taxed on the W-2 of the employee spouse and the tax rate that's used is the employee spouse even if the non-employee spouse doesn't work. Even if the non-employee spouse has a lower tax rate. So just so you know, that sounds kind of inequitable to me. All right, so I'm moving on to New York State. How am I doing? Oh, okay. All right, New York State. New York State follows the federal. New York State has many lines items on the federal that uh, mention the federal tax. So right now, if we were to file a joint, we would have a very hard time because according to New York State Tax Code 651B, it says to file a married filing joint return for a New York State resident to file a married filing joint return, it must be preceded by a married filing joint or married filing separate federal return. So clearly, that legislation has to change, as does the forms, because 
We have no idea what the forms will look like. I'm going to try and really speed up. New York State doesn't allow itemized deductions many, many times. State local taxes are not allowed, and certain other itemized deductions are limited. Therefore, many of us end up taking the standard deduction, which is equal between two singles and the marriage filing joint. So there's no difference in that. Now, my state and local tax department did have a long conversation with New York State, and we were told that we are confident that the 651B, the tax laws, will be changed, as will the tax forms. So I am confident that this will all happen, but at the time of this uh, panel, uh, the ink isn't, isn't there yet, at least yesterday and today it might have come, but I don't know. Um, I'm almost done. Thank you. Okay, another thing we don't really know about that was touched on is uh, will married uh, couples, that, or couples, same-sex couples married outside of New York be able to file married filing joint return to I have not found anything on point at this time. I've looked and looked, but I haven't looked yesterday and today. So, but um, once again, when we talked to the New York State taxation, we were, we were given assurance that couples married, same-sex couples married in other states will be able to file married joint here in New York. Okay, um, there's another, I wanted to just mention one more thing. When you file a married filing joint return, I just want to tell our community this, there are legal obligations attached to that. There are legal obligations attached to married filing joint. You are each taking responsibility for the other partner's tax items on the return. In fact, there's a saying that says that a signing partner is responsible for the sins of the other partner. So I want you to, to think about that. Um, okay, so what does this mean to you? Not that much. Uh, most tax dollars are on the federal level. The lion's share of taxes are on the federal level. The rates are high, and of course there's DOMA. Um, we can't have, most of us will file, have uh, tax-free health insurance now, except for certain employers who are not subject to the health rules and can still ask to be reimbursed by the employee spouse. Okay, so what can you do to maximize your tax, this, this tax situation? What can you do? I would advise everybody, couples, to see the same accountant, to try to see the same professionals, so your legal and financial world are in one spot. I can't tell you how many times people come to me sharing assets, sharing a house, and they're going to different accounts. That stratifies your life even further. Okay, plan, 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 thinking you get married, see, see professionals. It's a case-by-case -case basis. I think that was very obvious up to this point. It's a case-by-case -case basis. Anyway, just one last thing. You can expect if you do get married that your tax preparation fees will be higher because of the inconsistency between the federal and the state filing. Just wanted to tell you that. Anyway, I hope that I have offered you something during this short time. Thank you very much and I'll be around for questions. Thank you. Uh, and and this, is, this is actually one of the puzzles. Uh, and the New York State Tax Department is aware that a lot of people are puzzled about how we're going to reconcile the existing state tax law, which requires us to use our federal status when we file, and the right to marry in New York. And, and the fact that the marriage equality law says that same-sex and opposite-sex marriages are to be treated exactly the same for all purposes of New York law. So the tax department is aware they've been flooded with questions, and they have promised that they're going to issue written guidance so that everyone will know how you file your New York state taxes next year. And unfortunately, that guidance, as far as I know, hasn't been issued yet. I've been checking every day on the state tax department website. Uh, it was supposed to come out this week. They're taking a little longer. And some of the stuff that has to be changed may have to be changed through legislation, which means the legislature will have to amend the tax law. And uh, we don't know when that's going to happen. Some of it can be handled administratively. So on the tax stuff, we really have to say stay tuned. And uh, obviously, uh, the, the media and our community are going to publicize what happens. As soon as something happens that I can write about, it will be in ACB News the next week. So. Uh, be watchful on that, and uh, if you do marry, be sure to study the differences and the, the different ways that you have to file your state tax so you don't screw it up the first time around. Okay, uh, our next speaker is Lisa Padilla, who's going to be talking about the estate planning, the, the planning for the future that people should do 
if they get married, and maybe even if they don't get married. I am so excited. I am so incredibly excited that we have marriage because all of a sudden my world has gotten very, very um, safe. I've been in practice for about 24 years and I do mostly trust and estates. And I never understood when I heard certain very prominent, very, very um, thoughtful and very um, well-practiced attorneys as gay attorneys practicing gay law, giving advice to gay people about estate planning. It never made sense to me. It never made sense to me because I'm a tax attorney and I take a look at every single situation in terms of taxes. And I also think of every single situation in terms of an exit strategy. So this is what my life has been like recently. Phone rings, I've got my headset on, I press my button. Okay, Lisa, what do we do? Well, do you have a prenup? No, then you don't get married. That's it. That's the way I feel about it. You don't get married. Why don't you get married? You don't get married because there's issues in terms of consumer debt. There are certain situations where, and I'll give you an example, two weeks ago a client of mine sent me some documentation. She had a student loan facility, sent her a letter, congratulations on your marriage. To a man, we would like to know more about your husband. Please tell us his full legal name, his social security number, and where we can contact him. Okay, I looked at that document and I said, oh, I don't know that I would want to disclose that information because I was concerned that any kind of um, disclosure about the husband and his social security number would take the student loan people to the next step of collecting against maybe joint property or ownership. So I think that one of the things that is in every prenuptial agreement Michelle, correct me if I'm wrong, is usually something about debts. Okay. So we're not used to sharing debts as gay people in a relationship. We're used to having our own income and our own property and our own debts, and we're not used to having the opportunity to just fluff it off on somebody else. So I'm really worried about our community just jumping into marriage without thinking about things like consumer debt and also sharing assets. Client calls me and says, hey, I'm so excited about marriage. Now I can put the house into both of our names, right? Wrong. The reason why it's wrong is because we still have this annual exclusion problem that we're dealing with. Now the annual exclusion is you're allowed to give someone $15,000 per year per donate. And that's all you're allowed to give without having to file a gift tax return. If we were married and recognized, and our marriages were recognized on the federal level, then we can give our spouses an unlimited amount. It doesn't matter. Hundreds, thousands, millions, doesn't matter. However, because our relationship, relationships will not be on, recognized on the federal level, we can't do that. So we have to do more workarounds like what Judy Turkel was talking about in terms of maybe doing some sort of prenuptial agreement that says something along the lines of, you know, honey, we're going to stay married and this is going to be great and we can share all this property, but if we ever break up, the property comes back into the original owner's name, which means that it's not a gift and you don't have to file or you don't have to pay gift tax returns. So there are opportunities for us to share assets, but you have to be in a situation where you're working with someone who understands the tax laws and these very, very complicated prenuptial agreements in order to be able to get those workarounds. There are other issues that are happening which are absolutely fantastic. Usually I talk about how in estate planning that there are um, people who are looking into a coffin. And Inside of the coffin is usually a dead body and some assets, you know, real estate, retirement accounts, and you know, the guy who walks around with the, with the million dollars and the fidelity accounts, right? There's all this money and all of these assets that are in this coffin, and everyone is looking in the box to see what's in it for me. So you've got either the spouse or the domestic partner and the kids, they're looking at it saying, am I gonna stay in the house? Am I gonna get to go to college? Am I gonna have food on the table? Am I gonna have clothes on my back? There's a predator family member who is looking in, and everyone knows who that is. 
the better the family member is looking in and saying, gee, what can I get? What can I take from the domestic partner and those no good kids of uh, theirs? And there's also the IRS and New York State. And, uh, and you know what they're looking for. In New York State, the threshold for state taxes is $1 million. And in New York, that's not a lot of money. You start taking into account your co-op, your life insurance, and in your bank accounts, and things start adding up pretty quickly to a million dollars. On the federal level, it's $5 million. So you have a little bit more wiggle room, but really not much more. On the federal level, if you had federally recognized marriages, it would not matter how much you had in terms of assets on the first step, because it would pass in an unlimited fashion without any estate taxes to the surviving spouse. And everybody knows the Evie Windsor case and what happened to her, right? She was married to Thea. And if she were married to Theo, there would be no estate tax. But because she was married to Thea, she had to pay something like $350,000 worth of estate taxes. So you know, we still have difficulties in terms of, sure, maybe New York would be recognizing our relationships. But because we don't have federal recognition, we still have a lot of difficulty in terms of doing tax planning. So what do you have to do in terms of your documents? I think that a lot of documents have to be updated. And I think that not only do you need to do your prenuptial agreement, I think you also need to revise your estate plan. I think every single will needs to be updated by a codicil to recognize the marriage, to recognize that there is a life event. We always change, we always take a look at, and we always update state documents when there's a life event. And a life event is a marriage, a birth, or a death. If we're getting married, we've got to update these documents. So in addition to paying for the prenup, you also have to pay an attorney to do a revision to your estate plan. Do we have to revise trusts? In my opinion, yes, you do. Because once again, you need to recognize that there's a relationship that is now going to be a legal relationship that has to be um, uh, recognized. Do you have to update your health care proxy, your living will, your, pow your uh, power of attorney? Probably not. Your health care proxy is a document where you appoint someone to speak for you when you are incapacitated with respect to medical issues. That document is probably already in effect, and you don't have to change that one. Your living will is what your healthcare proxy is supposed to do for you. That's the pull the plug document, right? That you pretty much already have. I don't think marriage is going to change that. And your um, disposition of remains, which was the document that Judy was talking about, doesn't have to be changed either. And the reason why is because the public health laws has a list of priorities in terms of who gets to decide whether or not you get cremated or you get put into a coffin or you get you know, a Neptune Society burial. And the priority is if you're not married and you designate someone in writing and it's a notarized document and there are witnesses, then you can designate anyone you want, and that document has priority. The funeral partners have to take that document. The next in priority is spouses. And then the next in priority after that are domestic partners. So in this particular case, with respect to disposition of remains, we moved up in terms of the pecking order, that from a domestic partner, which is third, up to a spouse. Um, and your power of attorney, which is a document that you use to handle your finances when you're incapacitated, that probably doesn't have to be updated just because of marriage, because you probably designated your partner as the person to control your assets. But the form changed, and it's rotten. And you have to, you have to change it anyway. So thank you. Um, I know, I can talk. Um, I want to talk about presumption of property ownership. So two people own property, joint tenants with a right of survivorship. And that means automatically at the moment of death, the property passes from one to the other. And nothing really needs to be done. It's an automatic passing of property. You may have to do some legal paperwork in terms of bringing a document to the registry of deeds, but 
Other than that, the property is signed, sealed, delivered. It's in the surviving person's name. If you are a single person, 100% of the value of the property is in the estate of the first person to die. If you are a married couple, 50% is fully included in the estate of the first to die. Even though there's no estate tax on the passing of the property, the effect has to do with a step up in basis. So it's a very complicated tax calculation that needs to be done when you're a married couple and you need to deal with joint property ownership. Um, in addition to the prenuptial agreement, one of the things that I think that I'd like to see the uh, domestic partner, the uh, domestic relations attorneys make sure that people sign is the spousal waiver of retirement accounts. Because I can't tell you how many times I've seen the the retirement accounts be up for grabs, not only during divorce, but also on the estate tax level. So what happens is these retirement accounts are controlled by ERISA. And ERISA is a federal law. And the federal law says that if you have a spouse, then they have an automatic entitlement to your retirement accounts. But sometimes we have prior relationships, stepchildren, um, various issues why you would not want to have your spouse have a retirement account. And if people get married, even though we may not be recognized on the federal level now, I believe, Michelle, we are going to be. Here I am, I'm saying it, what you said 20 years ago. I believe we are going to have federal recognition pretty soon, and I do believe that these documents are going to be necessary. And if we get the federal recognition and then we start doing these spousal waivers, I don't know what effect they're going to have. I'd rather see them have the, the clients have the spousal waivers now as part of their complete package. Um, my time is up, uh, but what I'd like to offer you, I mean, is there are two things that um, the Medicaid letter that Michelle had spoken about and the list of property ownership that I'll give to you that you could upload for the website. And just to amplify what Lisa was saying about federal recognition, uh, you should be very aware that the constitutionality of the Defense of Marriage Act is now under heavy attack in the courts and by the Obama administration itself. So the, the situation we have, just to, to summarize it very quickly, there are about a dozen lawsuits around the country at various stages in federal courts challenging the constitutionality of Section 3 of the Defense of Marriage Act. That's the one that says the federal government will not recognize same-sex marriages. The most advanced of those challenges is a case that was filed in Boston by gay and lesbian advocates and defenders, and a companion case that was filed by the Attorney General of Massachusetts. Those cases, the federal judge held almost exactly a year ago that Section 3 was unconstitutional. The government appealed it, it's pending before the U.S. Court of Appeals in Boston, which is the first circuit court of appeals. The federal government announced in February, the Obama administration announced, that they had concluded that the Defense of Marriage Act Section 3 is unconstitutional, so they would not defend it, even though they appealed the ruling. So they notified Congress, because under federal law, if the Justice Department is not going to defend the statute, they must notify Congress so Congress can intervene to defend the statute if they want to. The House of Representatives has a legal advisory committee made up of the Speaker of the House, the two chief Republican leaders, and the two chief Democratic leaders. So it's a five-member committee with three Republicans and two Democrats. To no one's surprised, the committee voted three to two that they would defend Doha. Uh, so they hired uh, Paul Clement, who was the chief uh, attorney for the Bush administration during its second term. Uh, the official title being Solicitor General of the United States, and he has intervened on behalf of the House Legal Advisory Committee before the First Circuit and in several other pending cases. So Doma is being defended, but the Federal District Court held it unconstitutional, and as we mentioned before, a bankruptcy judge on the West Coast held it unconstitutional, and the House decided not to intervene in that case, 
So the Justice Department said, we are not going to oppose joint bankruptcy filings anymore by married same-sex couples. So we're chipping away at DOMA. And there is a strong reason to believe that it might be declared unconstitutional, even in the Supreme Court, which is ultimately where we're going to have to end up within the next few years. Now, just having DOMA declared unconstitutional doesn't end things. It doesn't mean that automatically the federal government's going to start recognizing same-sex marriages. So there, we should also note that yesterday, we had the first hearings in Congress on a bill that was introduced in the Senate by Senator Feinstein of California and in the House by Representative Terry Nadler, who represents this district, I believe, uh, which would not only repeal DOMA, but would provide that the federal government will recognize all lawfully contracted marriages. So uh, if that were to be enacted, that would end the whole problem of marriage recognition. It's not going to get a hearing in the House in this session. But depending how the elections go next year, it perhaps to get a hearing in the House as well. So there are, there's a move of legislatively to get rid of DOMA and to substitute marriage recognition. And there's a move in the courts to have DOMA declared unconstitutional, which is much further advanced. So our last uh, panelist is Noemi Maslia, who is one of our community's leading advocates and experts in immigration law. We'll talk about the effect of marriage equality on immigration. Yeah. Huh. Can everybody hear me? So this may not affect everybody here, but I'm sure everybody has a friend who has a friend who uh, immigration uh, is It's very important. Okay, and I'm gonna read my stuff because I have a lot to say and I don't want to miss one point, okay? So while many couples felt nothing by relation on the weekend of June twenty-fourth. There's a considerable number of New Yorkers for whom what happened was bittersweet. Probably more bitter than sweet. These New Yorkers are the binational couples where one in the pair does not have permanent status in the United States. The Monday after the Friday, when I was prepped that weekend, I got voicemails and uh, many people calling. Now, is this going to help me? They knew the answer, but they still felt they should ask it. And uh, unfortunately, it does not. But I'll talk about all that and I could hear how sad and frustrated they were. And I will quote you from an email that I received from a couple, the American who is a CDSC member. You know, it was nice that they passed the bill in New York, but to us it felt like a slap in the face and only reinforced the discriminatory nature of DOMA, which establishes a double standard among US citizens. So section three of DOMA precludes the granting of any federal benefit to any same-sex married couple. And immigration law is a federal law. So its benefits, like permanent residence and many uh, forms of relief from deportation, which, uh, same, which an opposite couple, married couple, can get for the foreign national spouse, same-sex couples still cannot. And it's not because I'm an immigration lawyer that I say this, or maybe it is because I'm an immigration lawyer that I say this, but the dullest impact on binational couples is the law's rules. Um, there's a threat of separation from a partner, from a spouse, and in many cases, children, there is actual separation. And they, um, the law causes such an imbalance when one of the partners is not a US citizen or a permanent residence. Uh, the financial toll it takes on many couples, it's you know, traveling back and forth as school, as a students, as a, I'm sorry, as tourists, to uh, be a student, a foreign national student, it's cost a fortune. And, Many Americans have decided to be exiled from the United States. They would rather live anywhere else but and be with their partner. So family unification, which is thoroughly acknowledged, which has been acknowledged as being the primary mission of the US immigration law, does not include ours. So whether a green card holder or a US citizen and a foreign national should enter into a marriage involves a cost-benefit analysis between possible benefits that could be derived from from marrying and the possible risks that come with marriage. So let's start first with the risk which, of which binational couples should not marry. Okay, there are some foreign nationals that are here on non-immigrant visas. And these types, certain type of non-immigrant visas require that the foreign national, whether we're applying for the visa or at entry at the airport or declaring why they're coming, prove that they have absolutely no intention of remaining in the United States, that they have a, per, uh, a permanent residence, 
abroad, which they have no intention of abandoning. So visas like that, the tourist visa, the student visa, the exchange visitor visa, these require that the applicant overcome the presumption of having an intention to immigrate. It's a funny way of looking at it, but they have to prove that they have no intention of residing. If marriage to a U.S. citizen comes up, whether in the application or at entry and saying it, that person could be denied the application visa or even entry to the United States. It makes the burden very hard. And many a consular officer or customs guy, a customs and border protection agent at the airport, will have a hard time being convinced that someone with a spouse in the United States will not remain here beyond the terms of that non-immigrant visa. Visa may be denied, entry may be denied, the visa may be revoked, and a situation which brings on a host of huge complications for the foreign national to then be able to get to the United States, if ever. Okay? So who else should not marry? Someone who can possibly immigrate as an unmarried child of a permanent resident or a U.S. citizen should not, should perhaps not get married. Permanent residents can only file for their unmarried children. The quota backlog for married sons and daughters of U.S. citizens is much, much longer than the one for unmarried ones. Okay? So now you're going to ask me, I anticipate the question, so I'll answer them. Well, why stay on any form that I'm unmarried if the feds will not recognize my marriage? Why should they be able to have it both ways? Not give me the benefit of marriage, but then penalize me for it? Great question. And in a liaison meeting that the American Immigration Lawyers Association had with the um, United States Immigration, uh, Citizenship and Immigration Service, that question was asked, how should the married applicant answer, answer the question on immigration forms? And the U.S. Citizenship and Immigration answered, the question is under review. Well, that was this past May, and the question is still under review. My advice has been that it's not a misrepresentation for a married same-sex spouse to answer unmarried in any such context, given that the context does not recognize the marriage. You may be married in New York, but you're not married in the United States. But I am, however, growing more and more uncomfortable with this position, given the recent statements by the administration that they will not defend DOMA and the federal court decisions finding that DOMA is unconstitutional. However, I leave it up to the conscience of my clients. Let the conscience be their guide with how they want to answer that question. So now for the flip side. Who can marry and not risk anything in the, in the world of immigration? Well, those foreign nationals who have or are applying or who have uh, those non-immigrant visas that where immigrant intent is not a problem. That would be uh, the skilled workers category, intercompany transferee, a representative of a foreign government, they don't have to prove that they will not immigrate in the United States. So having a U.S. spouse or a permanent resident spouse is not a problem. Somebody who is here in unauthorized status because he overstayed his visa or entered the United States without permission, they can get married without any risk. The marriage, the marriage licensing folks in New York don't ask what one's immigration status is and they will not report an undocumented person to the immigration service. Okay, who should get married? It may be beneficial for some people, some foreign nationals to marry a United States citizen or a legal permanent resident. For example, an asylum seeker. Marriage to a same-sex spouse would be an important piece of evidence to support the applicant's claim to being gay, a member of that particular social group which is required as a gay person. Also, his status and his holding himself out as a married man, as married to another man, may increase the dangers that he faces back home. If a foreign national is in removal proceedings, having a United States citizen or a permanent resident spouse may present an argument for prosecutorial discretion for administratively terminating the case or maybe granting a long, long continuance to see what happens with DOMA, given that it is in such flux, okay? Um, there is no blanket policy from the courts, the immigration courts, saying that we will hold these cases in abeyance, that we will give long continuances, that we will terminate. However, they, on a case by case, they will look at the cases and maybe grant them. We've been very successful in several of them, and we have many more down the pipeline where the clients are this step away from being removed, maybe permanently from their spouses. And so, you know, you have to have a thick stomach to be able to do this. 
Um, who can marry now and maybe get a benefit later? If Section 3 of DOMA is repealed and people can, U.S. citizen spouses can file for their married people, they may pay to get married now if you're in one of those categories where you're not risking anything because uh, the law is that if you, if at the time you get granted permanent residence, you've been married for less than two years, you only get conditional permanent residence, and you have to reapply later to have the condition removed. So if you've been married for maybe two years, by the time you almost repealed, you may have not have to go through that extra step. Although, you know, I don't know how it will be deemed, whether um, the clock will start ticking at the time you got married or when Doma was repealed, but that's a luxurious um, concern that you know, I can't wait to deal with. Okay. Um, and what if the United American Families Act passes? WAFA, which is legislation that's been introduced since the year 2000, that would amend the Immigration Act to um, to include the word permanent partner where the, spou where the word spouse um, uh, is, in, is now in most cases. Um, we, would, we would have to be able to show that the bona fides of the relationship and um, a marriage certificate, although you don't have to be married to qualify for a permanent residence under WAPA, uh, having a marriage certificate is certainly good evidence of the bona fides of that relationship. Um, okay, I just want to say something for um, the, the transgender folks were uh, either one or both are transgender and they're going to get married now in New York. It would behoove them for immigration purposes to indicate on the license <coughs> Um, that they are bride or groom or not to indicate the neutral spouse because for immigration purposes, immigration has to be convinced that that marriage was seen as an opposite sex marriage uh, in the jurisdiction where it was celebrated. So I've had cases where they got married in Boston and Massachusetts did not say it on the, birth certificate, on the, on the marriage certificate, so we have to prove that that's it, very complicated. So it would make things easier if um, they were not. Also, if you have nothing to lose, if you have nothing to lose and you're married, you might want to file a petition by the U.S. petitioner may want to file a case for the spouse. If they have nothing to lose, and that has to be examined very carefully, just to, I don't know, make a political statement about it. Uh, we had a client for whom we got withholding of deportation, which uh, by the asylum judge, by the immigration judge, the immigration judge couldn't grant him asylum, but granted him withholding which meant that he cannot be removed. He doesn't have asylum, but he cannot be touched by immigration. He cannot be deported. He married his United States citizen spouse. He filed an I-130. That's the petition by the spouse. And they were scheduled in the San Francisco District <coughs> Office. They were scheduled as any opposite sex marriage. They had to show the bona fides of the marriage. Um, they were very warmly received. And to our surprise, uh, the examiner said, you know, I'm sorry, I can't approve your case, but I won't deny it either. We'll hold it for review. Okay, so. okay. Now we have an opportunity for you to ask questions. And uh, are we, we going to have a second mic here? Yeah. Okay. I'm going to go by the arc. Okay, so if you have a question, please go over by the arc, and there will be a mic there so you can speak. We really need to have people on the mic because we're taping this and we need to get the sound on there for people who couldn't make it today. So questions have to be on the mic. And tell me who you're directing your questions to when you ask the question. Okay. Um, I'm directing also to the Is it on? Hello? And speak directly into the mic. Okay. Um, this is directed to everybody. Everybody in it. If, um, for a couple who has previously gotten married in Canada, is there any advantage to getting married in New York State, if in fact one can even get married in New York State? So I guess that's a two-part question. We're all laughing because we've had this discussion, so... Everyone's asking. Take it away. That was my personal FAQ. From the moment that Friday night, no one was getting immigration questions, my personal FAQ was emails. Judith, as you know, we were married in Toronto. Can we get married again if we pass this tonight? So I thought the answer was no. It turns out the answer is you can. New York will allow you to get married if you've already been married, but there is no legal reason to do so. And some of us think that there's some legal reason not to do so. Your marriage was validly recognized under Patterson's Executive Order 2006, I think that was. I don't know, it was a couple years ago. 
The Gary Patterson authorities said that now Americans validly perform elsewhere were more recognized. They're still recognized, or even more so recognized now. So there is no legal reason, and personally, I don't think there's any benefit, and I think that a, in a breakup or a custody issue, that a really creative lawyer could find some way of making that maybe, 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 maybe adverse to have done so, and could potentially uh, invite forum shopping with that of a future litigation as to, well, are we really a Canadian resident, or a New York resident, or was the marriage, and what laws are. So my personal view is have a party, make a donation, um, but you're married. <laughs> For the most part, I would agree with you, so maybe I'm not the best, the best person to take the mic because Lisa doesn't agree, and I don't think Hart agrees, so let me go me uh, a little bit. I have clients who are getting married in New York who have already been married in other jurisdictions because they feel that it's a uh, civil disobedience statement that it's very, very important to have as many people who are eligible to get married as a gay couple to get married in order to put the numbers on the board. And their marriages are not counted if they're married in Canada. So they want to be married here. Okay. That aside, um, there are, in my view, and for estate tax purposes and for you know the stuff that I do, there's absolutely no difference whether or not someone is married in Canada or anywhere else. Or multiple times. Right, and, and to the just, same person. To the same right, person. And, and, and this, is, this is the important thing. When you go to apply for your marriage license, they'll ask you if you're already married to anybody else. They don't care if you're already married to the person you want to marry. That's how you can right. get married. Yeah. Uh, and, and my partner and I went to Connecticut two years ago and got married, and we have no intention of doing it again. I asked him, do you want to get married again? He said, once is enough. <laughs> but my, cons my concern was just whether, you know, just to make sure that... It'll be recognized. That there was... It's valid. You know, I just want to have as much protection as possible, so... But the answer well, is no. I the point is, you laminate that Canadian marriage certificate, and you make lots of copies, and you spread them around, and you keep one in your safe deposit box, and one in your desk, and one in your glove compartment, and you have a car. So have lots of evidence to deal with that. Thank you. Well, my question is for Arthur, but also the whole panel, if they have want to chime in. It's about portability, and especially these are so close to the Hudson River now, especially for people in New Jersey. Um, as so many people who work in New York City live in New Jersey. Um, for couples who live in New Jersey who want to get married in New York now, just hop, 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 hop on the path and get married here, um, will, will, there, will they be automatically recognized as a civil union in New Jersey, or do they have to, they will be automatically? The, the, the Attorney General of New Jersey issued an opinion after the New Jersey Civil Union Law was passed saying that people who were married in other jurisdictions uh, same-sex couples who are married in other jurisdictions would be recognized as having a civil union in New Jersey. There's also, I think, at least one case in New Jersey of a judge saying that someone who was married elsewhere can get a divorce in New Jersey. This particular judge agreed to recognize the marriage for the limited purpose of granting a divorce. And just in case any of you plan to uh, get married here in New York and move to Wyoming, uh, you should be reassured that the Wyoming Supreme Court recently ruled that a couple, same-sex couple married out of Wyoming could get a divorce in Wyoming. Uh, they, they have a peculiar marriage recognition statute in Wyoming that basically says that if your marriage was legal where you got married, we're going to recognize it in Wyoming. I think as a result of the Wyoming Supreme Court's decision, the legislature may amend that statute. But uh, as of now, uh, there are a handful of states around the country which will recognize same-sex marriages from other states purposes of divorce. And just as a quick follow-up for the panel, would, I mean, are there strategic or financial or legal reasons why couples from New Jersey who get married in New York should move to New York as a, as a benefit, or they like when they're living in New Jersey? Are the taxes higher in New York than New Jersey? <laughs> Depends. <laughs> Property taxes higher in New York. Cultural. 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 Cultural reasons. <laughs> Cultural reasons. They have great culture in New Jersey. <laughs> this is sort of related to the Canada question, but um, my wife and I were married in Massachusetts, but in the first year or two when there was that residency requirement um, and we didn't move to Massachusetts, 
is there, do we need to get married in New York to make our marriage legal, or should we get remarried in Massachusetts now that there's no residence requirement, and we're concerned we're gonna have a baby in a couple months or a second, and we wanna know if this is gonna help be able to put her on the birth certificate. Yeah, see, see, my, my advice as an individual would be, if you're gonna have a baby in a few months, it couldn't hurt to get married here in New York and make sure that when the baby's born, you're a legally recognized couple, if there's any doubt whatsoever. And the benefits are just because you can get on the birth certificate, but we should all do the adoption anyway? Yeah, or, so in case you move, you know, that there's no question wherever right. you go, because adoption judgments by the court are entitled to full faith and credit throughout the country. So, uh, birth certificates, there are some... You can, put, you can put both parents' names on the birth certificates even if you're not married. No. Sorry. You can put both parents' names on the birth certificate even if you're not married, but it does not create legal rights. It's the adoption that creates the legal relationship. Some evidence in the relationship um, that does not create the legal right. Uh, as so parental rights. Does the marriage... What does the marriage do for with respect the to parental children? rights? Yeah, okay. the New so, York marriage. So this is what you just started talking about. Right now, there's I think we decided three statutes that um, uh, have bearing. One says that a woman, who, a married woman, who conceives a baby by an honest sperm donor while married, that by simply writing something with her husband, does say husband in uh, case law, uh, can say that's the children, legal child of both parents. Um, that may apply. The other one says that a child born of two parents who later marry is the legitimate legal child of both parents. That may apply. The third one is that Judy pointed out when we're having this discussion is that the new law basically says that anything in the existing law about rights of spouses and, and families uh, of really related to spouses has to be interpreted in a gender neutral way. So there's a very good argument to be made that if you're married to a same-sex person and one of you is biologically related to the child, it's both your children. But I, you know, what I said, and I think you agree is the problem most people here agree is that we're still recommending the adoption because it's not clear even in New York they know both be legal parents. And it's certainly pretty clear in other states you won't be a legal parent, whereas there's been, there's been no cases or incidents that we know of where another state didn't recognize a sister state's adoption. So we're still recommending the adoption. But do you want to add something to it? Well, I was going to just add on the marriage, the um, other. Okay. On the Massachusetts marriage question, the person who asked it, on your Massachusetts marriage question, there was a uh, glad gay lesbian advocate who defenders, I believe, did a major case after the Massachusetts had the residence issue. And as I, as I recall it, those people who were not Massachusetts residents but got married in that window, their marriages were valid. If they were Massachusetts residents, there was a whole distinction. But you might want to look on their website or check with yeah, them. Yeah, I saw that. I, I think it did say that you had to, just for that window. There was a window, so if you were in that, right, a short window. If you were in that right. window, you're probably fine. But as I said, in your particular case, it might not be the end of the world to do it again. Thank you. And, and another thing to keep in mind, if this is just a formality marriage to make sure that you got the papers, you don't have to have a banquet, you know, you don't have to have <laughs> you, know, you can go down there, you get the certificate, yeah. 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 you go down there, you get the certificate, you wait 24 hours, or you get a judge to waive it for you, and you have someone officiate, and you a quick ceremony. That's anti-party. Well, you see, my partner and I have always been you know, and, and we called up my mom and told her we were married and came home. Uh, my question is continuing um, second parent adoption issues. Um, I'm just wondering if you can see any other less invasive way of asserting parentage with the, um, the change in marriage law. I, mean, I actually have a, my experience is being married in California and a lawyer did a, a judgment of the court which was asserting parentage. Um, I know America doesn't have that, but I'm also interested in how um, you know, just seeing this, uh, I'm wondering how if the marriage 
probably, you know, as it develops is there, like how I would legally allowed to adopt the something that came from the marriage, the product of the marriage. I think give it some time it may change. Some of the judges have indicated an interest in having a conversation with lawyers about how marriage is going to change adoptions, but nothing's changed yet. So in other states, for example, they've done away with the requirement of a home study for married same-sex couples. But New York isn't ready for that yet. I think that you know, many of us who are active in these legal issues will, will try to initiate conversations with the judicial system to try to open up at least the possibility of making it more like We don't have parent majorities in New York, but we still have an adoption, but it could be done as a simplified, expedited kind of adoption without all the huge amounts of work, without the homestead. We're not there yet. So for anyone who's doing it now, it's, you know, be happy to live in New York. We can do a second kind of adoption at least, and you can do it all the way. Yes. Yeah, and, and it's clear that we still have a legislative agenda in New York, and anyone thought that we don't have other things we have to get passed, it would probably be a good idea to get the domestic relations law amended, amended to take account of same-sex marriages and all these situations. All right, so contact your legislators. I'm Deborah Jacobs. I'm in editor at Forbes, and I interviewed Art yesterday for a story I'm doing looking at the personal finance implications of state laws recognizing marriage some of the issues that we touched on tonight, estate planning, income tax, debts, divorce, children. Um, I'm here with Vanna Lee, also reporting for Forbes, sitting to Shelley's right, and we would love to talk with couples who have these concerns and would like to share their stories for this story. Um, real life examples make a piece like this, nuts and bolts piece like this really come alive. So if you'd like to participate in the story, um, please come and see us and uh, give us your name and phone number. Even if you don't have time to talk now, we'd like to follow up with you in the next couple of days. We're working against a very short deadline. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And we have uh, about uh, 10 more minutes before we're out of time. So uh, next question. Quick, Shelley, I just uh, need some clarification. If the tax forms and the tax laws don't change, before the end of calendar year tax year 2011, the same-sex married couples in New York file as single. If the, well, the, the forms don't change. Do they file as married but how do, or as single individuals? How do how do same-sex couples file currently? Is that your question? If they get married, how do they file? Oh, if they get married, then they're going to file joint. The forms are going to be changed. They have to be changed. The law changed. So New York State Tax Department just has to catch up and change the forms and change the 651B legislation so that New York State decouples from the federal return. Federal is individual. State is That's right. The, the couples will file either single or head of household on the federal level and married filing joint or married filing separate on the uh, state level if they're married. Thank you. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, can I just follow up on that? My understanding now is even if, let's assume the New York changes the state filing requirement and you're able to file a New York joint. I think in order to properly complete the federal tax return, you're probably going to have to fill out a second New York correct. state return as single to use those numbers to fill the federal tax return. That's, That's right. She's, this woman is talking about the logistics of the filing. How uh, even now today when I do returns, people married in Massachusetts or whatnot, there's always two separate files. The file and you're dealing with the tax program. You have to, and those of you who are going to do it yourself or do it manually, they're going to be, you're going to have to have two separate uh, calculations. Yeah, the, the point is this is a problem that uh, first arose in 2004 when uh, people began to marry in Massachusetts. And they discovered that you really have to make out three returns. You have to make out a dummy federal return as if you're married, a single federal return for each of you, and a married state return, and you use the figures from the dummy federal return to fill out the state married return. 
because because your, your state numbers have to come from your federal numbers. That's correct. That's what they've done in Massachusetts. Uh, that's what they've been doing in Connecticut. You know, and I, I believe I'm, I'm told that TurboTax and some of the other <coughs> programs are trying to accommodate this and figure out how you can do it mechanically and you're not using a lot of count. I'm, I'm not sure how they do this. He's a dead accountant. But, <laughs> well, I'm, I'm talking about a virtual account, you know, which is online. I know you don't like virtual accounts. I, I, I don't like virtual lawyers. <laughs> thank you. Hi, thank you. Uh, I turned 60 this year, and there are many of us in this room that are thinking about things that happen once you get older. So, my question is, if one of us, if we get married, and one of us suddenly, to our surprise, has to be in a long-term care facility, and we have to spend down, what is that number that we have to spend down to? And that might make it the decision about getting married or not a pretty good one. So this letter that we had referenced previously is from the head of the Medicaid program on the federal level. And even though Medicaid is a federal program, it's administered through the states. What this letter says is that every single couple who is in a state-recognized marriage, if they handle their finances in such a way that a straight, federally recognized married couple would handle it, then it would be um, on parity. So what happens in a federally recognized marriage is that there's a well spouse and there's not a well spouse. The not well spouse goes into the facility. The well spouse gets to keep all the resources. And what's going to happen in New York, I'm, I'm pretty confident about it, is that we'll be able to have that same kind of um, treatment in terms of our finances so that it's, it will be regardless of whether or not it's a straight couple or a same-sex couple, the well spouse will still be able to retain resources. And that's really important because, as you know, it costs a lot to live and facilities cost a lot as well. And Medicaid planning is a very, very uh, specific specialty and you need to see some, like I don't even do Medicaid planning. It's a very, very specific field because there is um, lots of forms that you need to fill out. There are lots of things that you need to do in terms of protecting your assets. It's not just regular estate planning. It's significantly more. And hopefully people have long-term care insurance. A lot of long-term care insurance now has domestic partner um, discounts as well. I see you shaking your head. You're not alone. A lot of people don't. I bought mine when I was 40. So there isn't a number that oh. you're aware of that you have to, that if you, that person had to go on Medicaid, that's, yeah, that's in total assets, and I don't know how much the income is. I'm sorry. There, there is, uh, as Lisa says, there's a specialty now. Uh, many lawyers are, who are practicing in this area called elder law, where they're intimately knowledgeable about all the details of this. So consulting someone who's a specialist is in elder law. Is there LGBT elder law specialist yet? Yeah, um, there, there's, there's uh, there's 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 there are some. Oh, yeah. you can name names. Oh, you want me to name it now? Oh, I was should I name this? Yes. Ralph. Um, uh, one of the lawyers who is um, uh, specializes in elder law and serves the LGBT community is Ralph Randazzo and Tom Siak. And Tom Siak. And you know, excuse me, can you repeat that again, please? Sure. Uh, there's Ralph Randazzo, R-A-N-D-A-Z-Z-O, and Tom Siaka, S-C-I-A-C-C-A. S-C-H-I-A. And they are both, I mean, I've worked with them, I've sent clients to them. You know, they are, they are, Elder law attorneys who are also very involved in, in uh, working with LGBT couples. So anybody who's looking uh, to be with an elder law attorney, we would say to them to them comments. Hi, thank you very much. This is a very informative panel. Um, I have an interesting dilemma, at least I think it is. Um, I just won the lottery. Um, <laughs> I got an 
engage, I mean, like, this is a man I want to spend the rest of my life with, um, but I have none of the paperwork in place except for healthcare proxy. Healthcare proxy. What risks do I run by just, I have no prop. we have no property um, individually. Um, well, you won the lottery, so you've got an income stream ahead. No. I have a date. I have a date and a date. Wow. <laughs> what, what's the risk? Do we have express prenups? Uh, we don't have express prenups, but you know, I talked about the individual postnuptial as well, um, and, and they can set forth the same. Uh, however, one thing I didn't get to say is, if you do an agreement about your property, you can put in basically any terms you want, even if you're the bazillionaire and you're saying, "If we break up, I'll give everything to my spouse or partner." Uh, as long as it's not under the rest. In your, so, so people often go into a marriage without a prenup, and they can do a postnup. If you are telling me that you have very little assets, relatively low debt, and the same is true of your uh, betrothed. Not, not really, I have retirement assets that I'm bringing in, and, okay. he, has, and he has two clients. Okay, so. <laughs> uh, so okay. But remember, your your okay, your life started here and now you're here. Right. So everything you acquired up to here is yours anyway. Once you are married and if your retirement assets grow, then your spouse is entitled to a share of the portion that, that accrued during the marriage. So let's say your pension is fifty seven thousand dollars now and then if you get divorced it's ninety seven thousand dollars. Your spouse is entitled to a share, an equitable share of forty thousand dollars that accrued during marriage. So that's that's the law, and I guess maybe I didn't cover this that well. When you get married, what you bring into the marriage, both debt and property, is yours as long as you don't commingle it. A pension you can't. If you said to me, I have a hundred thousand dollars sitting in a bank account, that's still yours. But if you put it in joint names, you could turn it into marital property. Um, the debt, same thing. It's it's his debt. And you're not responsible for it. No, it's, I mean that again. Not that people aren't going to try to collect it from you, but you're not responsible for it. So I think if I understand the circumstances we're talking about, you don't have a lot of risk. Uh, and even if you had a gazillion dollars and your betrothed had none, you, you could get married, and then if he wouldn't sign a prenup, and you could get a divorce. And if you get a divorce like right away. The marriage is going to be viewed as a very minimal or, or virtually non-existent relationship, so there's not going to be a lot of distribution. I mean, that, those are broad answers for what I understand. Mm -hmm. But Thank congratulations. <laughs> I have a question, actually, for the panel. Um, just because this gentleman won the lottery doesn't mean he has to get married tomorrow. No. Yeah. Right. He still has to get a marriage. So but he can get a marriage license. So once you get the license, doesn't I'm sorry, not tomorrow, so it's Sunday, 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 I'm sorry. So once you get, right, you have 60 days to be able to get married. All you're getting is the license, the right to get married. Right, I have, right. I have the slot to get married. Right. Oh. These, these are slots. Oh, the I mean, slot. you, you do not have to use it. You don't have to use the slot. Sunday is to be part of history. Right, mm -hmm. right. Well, you can be part of history, but with the post up, Michelle, do you need extra consideration in order to be able to make that valid? And once you're married, it's like, don't you kind of get fat and complacent? I mean, that's why I said when I talked about it that, um, you know, it's a little dicier. But generally, you might not do it, and that's going to, you know, that'll be an issue. Yes, we encourage people to do it before marriage, but plenty of people do it after. And, you know, if you want to go forward, having heard what you heard tonight, and, uh, you know, I hope we didn't dissuade anybody. I just, we were trying to educate people. I, I think, generally speaking, you'll be okay. But do a post up. All right, I've been getting the high sign here that we really have to wind yes. up. I'll sell my spot. So, uh, <laughs> Uh, the panel will hang around a little while if people have individual questions, but we really have to uh, have to turn it off now. Thank you very much for Thank you very much for